Good morning, church. It's been an awesome morning. Um, so this morning, I get the privilege to talk about sin, which is not the thing that a lot of people want to talk about. Um, so I've entitled my message today, Sin, the State of Our Heart. Sin, the State of Our Heart. Um, so many of us, like, we can... I don't know where that one came from. Thank you. Okay, that's fine. Just leave it on that for the moment. Um, so all of us at some time have felt lonely, depressed, misunderstood, rejected, betrayed. All these feelings exist because sin is in the world. And sin affects us personally, but it also affects us as a community because we carry it everywhere that we are. So today I'm going to be talking about what sin is, what sin does, and what is God's solution to sin, because he has the solution. Um, and so I started my preparation asking a few people, what do you think sin is? And saying, do you have questions about sin? Maybe questions that you had when you're a new believer or questions that you still have. Um, and I got some fantastic questions. Some of them I won't get to unpack today, but we know that sin is a foundational understanding. It's mentioned over 400 times in the Bible. Um, and so I want to ask the kids, because we've got the kids here today. Are there any kids who'd like to say what sin is? Any ideas of what sin is? That's okay. I don't mind asking. Um, I asked some of my kids, and they had responses like, sin is when you do something bad that God doesn't want you to do. Um, sin is when you do something against the will of God. Um, sin is when you do the wrong thing, and God gets to choose what's wrong and what's right. And all of those are good answers. Um, but in the Bible, yep, yeah, so that's what we're talking about today. What is sin? three types of sin and God's response to sin. And in the Bible, it gets a bit tricky because there's more than one word for sin. And some of the words are words we don't use in everyday life. There's words like iniquity, transgression, as well as sin. And unfortunately, when we use words in the Bible that we don't use every day, sometimes it can mean maybe that we might think they're not relevant anymore. Do those words even matter? Does sin even matter? Is sin outdated? Um, iniquity is a word that means crooked, like if your behavior is crooked or not straight. So if we're thinking like lying or murder, that would be iniquity. And transgression is often used to refer to when someone's trust is broken, so when we mistreat other people. But what about the word sin? Um, well, in Hebrew, the sin word is kata. I probably mispronounced that. And it means to miss the goal or to miss the target. So, Qatar or sin is a, a failure to fulfill a goal. And in the first few chapters of the Bible is where we see the first sin. We see humans were made in the image of God, that humans are sacred beings who represent the Creator and are therefore worthy of respect. That's how God intended us to be. And in this way of seeing the world, then sin is a failure to love God and a failure to love others by not treating them with the honor that they deserve. And we can see this in the Ten Commandments. We have five commandments showing this is how you can fail at loving God and another five saying this is how you can fail at loving people. And we see that together, when we sin against each other, when we sin against people, we are actually sinning against God. Um, in Leviticus 6.2, it says, If anyone sins and is unfaithful to the Lord by deceiving a neighbor about something entrusted to them or left in their care or about something stolen or if they cheat their neighbor, and then it goes on to say a few more things. But we see that when we fail to honor others, it's failing to love God. And so in a way, to sin is actually to fail to be truly human. Because to be truly human would be us in our true image of God, our true reflection of our creator. But sin came into the world, and that's why we see all these broken people, which are in fact like broken mirrors that can't reflect God properly. And so I want to look at three ways 
that sin shows itself in our lives. And the first one is in unintentional sins. So unintentional means that we didn't do it on purpose. A lot of time, people don't know that they're sinning. Sometimes we sin and we don't know that we're sinning. Or worse, we think we're actually succeeding. In the Bible, we have Pharaoh, the king of Egypt, who thought that he was doing a really good thing. He was protecting the national security of Egypt. He was trying to build Egypt's economy. And in his mind, making all the Israelites slaved just made sense because he was trying to do a good thing for Egypt. He's totally unaware that this is a bad idea. It's unintentional. We also have the story of King Saul, who's going around chasing David in the wilderness, trying to kill him because he thinks that David is a criminal. He thinks he's bringing a criminal to justice until he realizes that he is the criminal. And he says, I have sinned. I am the failure. So sin is more than just doing bad things. It describes how easily we deceive ourselves and spin illusions to justify our actions, our bad decisions as good ones. And even when you are a Christian following Christ, we can do that. In our minds, we go, you know what? You know, it's not that bad. It's actually doing really good for this or really good for me. But we forget that sin affects other people too. So why are humans such bad judges <laughs> of doing the right thing um, and living God's way? Well, we go back to Genesis, that first story in Genesis chapter 1. God made everything and it was good. The first time that God said something was not good was when he said it's not good for man to be alone. So God made Eve, the woman, and he gave them everything to enjoy. And we're going to start the story in Genesis chapter 2, verse 8 and 9. And in Genesis it says, The Lord God planted a garden in the east, in Eden, and he put the man that he had formed. The Lord God made all kinds of trees grow out of the ground, trees that were pleasing to the eye and good for food. And in the middle of the garden were the tree of life and the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And then the next one, the Lord God took the man and put him in the garden of Eden to work it, to take care of it. And the Lord God commanded the man, you're free to eat from any tree in the garden, but you must not eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. For when you eat from it, you will surely die. So Adam and Eve have it pretty good. They could eat of any of those good fruit trees. It's only one that was forbidden, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And Adam and Eve, they were perfect people in a perfect place. <laughs> they were in a close relationship with God. It says that every day, every evening, God would come down to the garden and they would walk and talk together. And yet they still sinned. We see in Genesis 3 the, what happened. The serpent or the snake was more crafty than any of the wild animals the Lord God had made. He said to the woman, did God really say you mustn't eat from any tree in the garden? The woman said to the serpent, we may eat fruit from the trees of the garden, but God did say you must not eat fruit from the tree that's in the middle of the garden and you must not touch it or you will die. So we see the serpent there with his deception. And what is that? Oh, here's his response. You are most certainly not. You can thanks, Ryan. You will not certainly die, the serpent said to the woman. God knows that when you eat from it, your eyes will be opened and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. So the serpent is saying to Adam and Eve, there's more for you. God's holding something back. Just take it, then you'll be like God. Um, and so Adam and Eve felt they were missing something. They thought, most probably, if I eat that, if I'm like God, surely will I not be closer to God? If I'm like God, won't I be closer and actually know God better? But it was disobedience. They were actually saying, we must know better than God. Because if you say, oh, God said don't eat it, I must know better. This snake is telling me new information. They sinned. So instead of looking towards God, to his presence that was in the garden with them, they tried to find 
more outside of God, without God. And sometimes we look for good things, but we look in the wrong places. Okay, if we are feeling stressed, we might go to alcohol because we need to relax. Okay, if we are looking for company, we might go to the wrong kinds of people to find that company. When God is the one that can give us everything that we need. So the Bible is telling us that our failed human behavior, our tendency for self-deception where we deceive ourselves, it runs really deep. It's rooted in our desires, in our selfish urges that make us want to act for our own benefit at the expense of others or at the expense of our relationship with God. And it can lead to a chain reaction of relational breakdown. Um, It may seem really unfair, but we know that as this shows us the first sin, that all sin comes from that. (laughs) So it it comes down from generation to generation. And you would know in your own family that sins of your parents have affected your life, whatever they may be. And the sins that we make now, they will affect my children's life. Okay? Um, There is hope. (laughs) But we need to know that there is a problem. So we have unintentional sins. Then, like this story here, we have our intentional sins, the ones that we do on purpose. We know it's wrong and we do it anyway. We all do it. Um, One of Nathan's favorite songs at the moment is a song called Mad, which you might have heard on 99.9. They play it sometimes. It's a kind of tongue-in-cheek song that looks at, um, even when you know it's wrong, it can feel good to be mad at somebody. It can feel fun to be mad when you're justifying, oh, they really did this. You know, um, kids, it's like when you don't pick up your toys, when you don't do your chores or tell the truth. Adults, it's when we lie. It's when we do things half-heartedly. It's when um, we pretend that something isn't wrong, and it is. We all sin on purpose. In the New Testament, the Greek word for sin is hamatia, I probably said that wrong, but it also means to miss the goal. And the Apostle Paul in his letters uses it to describe that we are slaves to sin. Slaves to sin. So what does that mean? That we feel helpless, that we feel like we have no choice. And in Romans seven fifteen, he says, I don't understand what I do. What I want to do, I do not do. And what I hate, I do. And we all feel that tension in ourselves. We know what the right thing to do is. And the tension is not wrong. We all feel that. That is natural. But it's our choice after that that can lead to sin or not. It can lead to disobedience or obedience. So kids, when your parents tell you to do something and you feel like, oh, I don't really want to, that's not the sin. The sin is if you choose not to obey. Um... Our family says that obedience is right away, all the way, with a cheerful heart. And I remember that about myself. When God tells me to do something, do I do it right away? Or do I, like, drag my feet and go, oh, maybe tomorrow I'll call that person, you know? Maybe maybe tonight when the kids are all in bed, I'll sit down and and, um, tell God that I'm sorry for something or make up with that person that I need to make up with. So we can seem plagued by sin. Um... Because sin is something that actually shows that we don't love God or others when we feel trapped in that sin. We can justify it and say, oh, it's not that bad, like King Saul did. Sometimes we can feel that the sin is just too big and too heavy and we don't know what to do. And those sins could be anything. They could just be maybe we judge people. Maybe um, we draw too much attention to ourselves. Maybe we uh, have something that we're addicted to. Maybe we are jealous. Maybe we are resentful. And we want to be free from those things, but we don't know how. So I'm going to give you a really silly illustration of something that I found really helpful when I was struggling, when I'm struggling with sins that seem to keep reoccurring. Okay, so I want you to imagine that Before everyone came to church this morning, in front of the stage here, someone put in a big pile of cow manure. 
okay? There's a big pile of stinking cow manure on the carpet in front of the stage. So when you come into church, you have two options. You can walk in and go, I don't think so, and leave the building. Or maybe you're a person that would go, oh, let's go get a shovel and a bucket and some cleaning supplies and we'll get it out of here and clean it up. Um, We can't leave it here because it stinks. It's really, really bad. And now I want you to imagine that because I'm coming in to speak today, I see or hear that there's cow manure in front of the stage. And I go up to Nathan and said, Nathan, I need your help. I'm really embarrassed about something. Um, So I just have to tell you. I have this secret sin that I just can't get rid of. And it's that I really love cow manure. I just... I just have to be around it. And if I just know that if I smell that cow manure, I'm just going to be go straight there and I'll have to touch it and play with it and just smell it. And look, it's just a really strong temptation. So could you pray for me that, you know, if it's still smell there, that I'm not going to get tempted to go and be near that cow manure because it's just too much for me. I really need your prayer. (laughs) And that would be one of the most unusual things that Nathan's ever had to pray for. (laughs) Um... But what do I mean by that? I mean that we sometimes pray over and over and over for the same sin. Do you? I do. It's that same one. Think, God, when am I ever going to get past this? You know, I know you've forgiven me. And I know that when I do it and I ask for forgiveness, I know that your grace covers me. But why do I keep doing it over and over again? And so what I have learned is that when we keep coming back to this same sin over and over again, it's because we actually love the sin more than we love God. Because think about it. If you hate something, you will do whatever you can to get rid of it. You know, if there is something that smells, like if you've got a dead gecko in your air conditioner or you've got a dead rat in the ceiling, you don't let it sit You do whatever you can to get that out of your house. And then you do whatever you can to get rid of the lingering smell out of your house. Like, it's got to be gone. But if you didn't hate the smell, you might think, oh, you know what, in a couple of weeks it'll be gone. And then it'll be all good. And in the meantime, I just won't invite anyone over to my house. Like, we, if we hate something, we would never choose it unless... Someone in authority chose it for us or because it was good for us. Like, you know, when you don't want to have your medicine because it tastes disgusting, but you know it's good for you. That's different. But we intentionally sin because we actually have chosen to sin because we love it. And the only way to be free from that is to change our attitudes, to have God's attitude towards that sin, which is to hate the sin. And you might disagree with me. You might think, I don't hate, I don't love that sin. But sin is missing the mark. Sin is missing the goal. And who gets to decide what that goal is? Only God. So the opposite of sin, then, is to hit the goal, to hit the mark. And we can only do that when we're aligned with God. Because sin stops us from being close to God. And it's destructive, destructive. And so we need to get rid of that sin. We need to avoid the sin. We don't want to get caught out like Adam and Eve, where we think, you know what? We know better than God. Or God is not enough for me. And later on, um, at the end of my message, we're going to have some time where we pray and ask God to change our hearts, to hate the things that he hates. Because sometimes it's hard. When we've been living a certain way for a long time, it's hard to change our hearts, but God can do it. So we have our intentional sins, we have our unintentional sins. And the third sin I'd like to talk about this morning is sinning against your conscience. Um, Sinning against your conscience is when something isn't a sin, but in our hearts we feel like it is. So when we think that something is wrong, and we do it anyway, it's basically the same as sinning because we're rebelling about, against what we think God would want us to do. Because in the end, sin is a condition of our heart. If in my heart I believe I'm doing something wrong and I do it anyway, 
It shows that in my heart I'm being selfish, that I'm doing what I want and not what God wants. Um, as an example, if I'm as an adult living with my parents in their house, maybe I think that eating the food out of their fridge is stealing because I could just buy it myself. My parents don't mind. They're like, yeah, eat whatever you want. But if in my heart I think that that is wrong and I do it anyway, I am consciously breaking down my relationship with my parents because I'm going to start feeling shame. I'm going to be feeling guilt. And then every time I see them, instead of joy for seeing my parents, I'm going to go, oh, I'm eating all their food and I'm stealing and I feel bad about it. And it's putting something in between me and my parents. It's stopping me from having that good relationship with them. And it's the same with God. When we are doing something that we think is wrong or know is wrong, we get that squeamish feeling in the pit of our stomachs. And we're like, oh, I know God wouldn't like this or I don't feel good. And then we get weighed down by guilt, by shame. And God doesn't want us to be like that. Because Jesus' sacrifice washes away all sin. He wants us to be in a close relationship with him. In the book of Romans, um, Paul talks about some people that were having arguments about what food was good to eat. We still have those today, don't we? <laughs> what food is good to eat? Um, and in Romans 14, 23, Paul's response was this. Thanks, Ryan. Whoever has doubts about what, the, about what they eat is guilty if they eat. That's because eating is not based on faith. Everything that is not based on faith is sin. Um, and there's a very well-known Christian saying. Um, we actually talk about it in our Step 1 membership course where we talk about our vision for the church. So we do have one of those coming up next, probably next month um, if you haven't done that yet. But we talk about that in essentials, we have unity. In non-essentials, we have liberty. And in all things, we have charity. And that talks about the fact that maybe someone thinks something's a sin that you don't think is a sin, and we don't want to be judging them. Okay? Um, we're not to judge what other people <laughs> think is a sin. We can look after them and look out for them. But ultimately, if you think something is a sin then you're acting like it is a sin. So what is God's response to sin? Because it's not all bad news. The word sin, we see this description of our human condition. Sin is a failure to be a human who fully loves God and others. It's our inability to judge whether we're succeeding or failing, and it's that deep selfish impulse that we have in our hearts that drives so much of our behaviour. And so I just want to share a couple of scriptures about how, what does sin do to our relationship with God. Ryan? Thanks, bud. Got a couple of scriptures coming up. In Isaiah 59, verse 1 and 2, it says, Behold, the Lord's hand is not shortened that it cannot save, or his ear dull that it cannot hear. But your iniquities have made a separation between you and God, and your sins have hidden his face from you so that he does not hear. So we see then that our sin separates us from God. We can't get close to someone when there's wrongdoing in the way. And this sinful condition plagues all of us. Um, and in Romans 3, verse 10 to 12 and verse 23, it says, As it is written, none is righteous, no, not one. No one understands, no one seeks for God. All have turned aside. Together they've become worthless. No one does good, not even one. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. And it's not a pretty picture. We don't like to hear that there's no, not even a single good person in the whole world. Not Mother Teresa, not anyone who's just laying down their lives for people. And that's why in the Bible the story of Jesus is such good news. When I was looking at how God responds to sin, I went back to Genesis to see what God did when they sinned. Um, the man and his wife, it's Adam and Eve, heard the sound of the Lord God as he is walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And they hid from the Lord God among the trees of the garden. And the Lord God called to the man, where are you? What was Adam and Eve's response to sin? They hid. Like, God, we've got to hide from you. We've done the wrong thing. 
We do that when we've sinned against someone. We just like maybe don't answer their messages, don't take their phone calls because we're feeling bad. But what is God's response? God knew that they had sinned. Did he run away from their sin? He looked for them. It was like this game of hide and seek. They think they're hiding and God's doing his part. It's like, okay, I'll do the seeking. I know where you are, but I'll pretend that I don't. God went looking for them. So we cover up and hide from God. We run away from God from our sin and God looks for us. He seeks us and we are still doing the same thing. We're trying to hide our sin from God and God is saying, I am coming looking for you. I have not given up on you. And this is what salvation is all about. And God sent his son Jesus to the world. Jesus was the truly one, fa- human one because he didn't fail to love God and he didn't fail to love others. He did not sin. He lived for others. He died for their sin. And when he was raised from the dead, he gave them the gift of life. He gives us that gift of life that washes away all our sins so we can be completely clean. In 1 Peter 2.22, it says of Jesus, he committed no sin, no deceit was found in his, ma- his mouth. He himself bore our sins in his body on the cross so that we might die to sins and live for righteousness. So we see that Jesus is the way. Always. As Nathan was saying earlier, many of us ask for forgiveness for our sins and then think we've got to do the rest. Now we've got to live a holy life. But you know what? Even if I could live 24 hours without sinning, it can't cover up my past mistakes. Only the sacrifice of Jesus can do that. Because forgiveness is a gift. You cannot earn it. And you know what? God wants us to know that his capacity to forgive us, his ability to forgive us is not based on how small our sins are. However big our sins are, God's forgiveness is bigger than that. All of us need a saviour. All of us need a saviour. Not just to be forgiven, not just to be clean, Um, in front of God, not just so that we can be in the heavens with him, but because the consequence of sin is great, and we don't want that either. We can ask God to wash over those consequences of sin and say, God, can you redeem those bad mistakes that I made? Can you redeem the bad attitudes that I have had? Can you make sure, Lord, Lord, can you take away some of those consequences they don't flow onto my family and the people that are around me? But none of that is based on what we do or our own efforts. So what is our response? Because it needs one. Hopefully we are full of joy at the fact that we have a saviour that washes all our sins away. Well, firstly, it comes down to realising or remembering that we are sinners without excuse. We have heard from the word of God that we are all broken people. Um. Only Jesus can save us and that we need to repent. And I feel that that has been happening today, that there has been repentance going on. Um, In the Northern Territory this weekend, there are Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islanders meeting around Uluru and they are praising God and they are repenting for the sins of of their past of their peoples. Not of what white men did to them, (laughs) of their own sins of their own curses and bloodlines and things that have been going on. And I think that is so powerful. You know, they need to do that for themselves and each one of us need to do that for ourselves. Because when we repent, repentance is us turning our hearts to God. Repentance is pulling down the walls and saying, God, I need all these things that stand between me and you to be gone so that I can know you better, so I can know you more closely. Because the closer we get to God, the closer he gets to us. The more like him we become. I think of it as like if you have a glass with some dirty liquid in it, you know, and you want to get the dirt out. 
But if we have the pure water flowing in, eventually all that debris can't stay there anymore. It's so full of this fresh water pouring in, pouring in. All the debris comes out. And so as we ask for more of God in our lives, all the me, all the sinfulness gets pushed out. And while on this side of the earth we will not be free from sin, we can become more and more like him and more and more aware of his grace and his mercy. We have testimonies that we should be sharing with other people to say, you know what, I used to be ashamed. I used to be guilty. I used to be down about myself and my bad decisions. But I have been washed clean of those decisions because of Jesus. And so then we need to follow him as a choice because we're called to live in a new way as new creations, to show the world what humanity is supposed to be like, fully loving God and fully loving others. Because of Christ, we are on a journey that will have greater and greater victories over the sins and the weaknesses that have dominated our lives. Um, so, church, um, we're going to have an opportunity to pray. And I'm going to do two prayers. The first one is that there may be people here that have never given their life over to God before, that didn't know that they could ask Jesus to wash away the sins in their lives. And so if that's you, if you feel that today, you would love to say, God, I want you to forgive all my sins because I want to be a new person. If you would like to just raise your hands and I would love to, to pray for you today because that is an awesome decision. No worries. But the second prayer today, church, is that I would love for us to pray and ask God to change our hearts that we would hate sin, that we would love God enough and love him more than the sin that we fall into from those wrong mindful thinkings that we have. The when we put ourselves first and our own feelings instead of the God who loves us and gave his only son for us. So why don't you just bow your heads and I'd love to pray for you. Lord God, we thank you that you sent your son Jesus, who was perfect in every way, who was tempted and did not sin. And we thank you that the sacrifice of Jesus on the cross, the shedding of his blood, has washed away every sin. And Lord, we thank you that we are forgiven in Jesus' name. And Lord, as we long to be more and more like you, please change our hearts that we would hate sin and that we would love your way of doing life. Lord, help us to fully love you and to fully love people who are made in your image. Thank you, Lord, that you forgive us of our guilt. You forgive us of our, um, Lord, of any shame and that that too is washed away in the blood. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. I'm going to hand over to the band.